optics and magnetic session. Uh, I'm Parvati Prem from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and my co-chair, also our first speaker today, is Ian Garrick Bethel from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, a note to the speakers, you will hear one alarm at 10 minutes. That means you have two minutes left, and then you'll hear another alarm at 12 minutes. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, my co-chair, Ian Garrick Bethel, who will be talking to us about a magnetized elliptical disk on the moon. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you about a well-known magnetic anomaly on the moon, Reiner Gamma, and I'm going to show you a model uh, to try to explain uh, the optical features you see on the soil here, uh, as well as some of the magnetic field structures we observe from high above it. All right, so uh, some preliminaries. Uh, this is known as a lunar swirl. So lunar swirls are locations where you have magnetized crust, and you have these sinuous albedo features on the soil. Uh, and swirls, I would argue, are, are uh, extremely interesting uh, features in the solar system because they're at their intersection of numerous uh, fields in planetary science. Um, and so here you can see on the right is Reiner Gamma, the type example. It's about 60 kilometers across. And here there is a local magnetic field measured by spacecraft indicated by these uh, arrows coming out of the page that show you the uh, B field magnetic field. So uh, these things are interesting because they uh, have something to do with space weathering. We think that protons, which normally darken the lunar soils, are blocked uh, in most places at Reiner Gamma and may be leaking in at these dark areas here you see that people usually refer to as dark lanes. That's just one interesting thing about uh, lunar swirls. Another one is that there may be a relationship with uh, surface water production. So the protons may react uh, with oxygen in the soil normally to make small amounts of OH and H2O. Uh, and that process may be stopped here at lunar swirls. Uh, and so uh, this could be a, an opportunity to use these as laboratories to understand surface water uh, production. Uh, it's also uh, obviously a space physics problem to understand how uh, the solar wind protons interact with the magnetic field. And it's also a problem in planetary magnetism to understand how actually this rock was magnetized in the first place. So uh, the origin of these and their formation is still uh, actively debated. Uh, this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on planetary uh, magnetism applications of studying uh, swirls. So, okay, planetary magnetism. Uh, you want to understand the moon's dynamo generation and the history of the moon's dynamo. It's pretty surprising the moon ever had a dynamo for such a tiny little core. Um, and some observations are from orbit. We know that the crust of the moon is magnetized uh, at very large scales, as you can see in this map of both hemispheres of the crustal uh, magnetization. Um, and here's another map that shows you the very strongest magnetic fields on the moon. You can see these greenish contours in illustrating the strongest fields. And you can see Reiner gamma is there, the Reiner gamma magnetic anomaly and swirl. The surprising thing is we don't know how a single one of these features have formed, actually. We have ideas, but we don't have any definitive answers to how these formed. It most likely uh, formed from some dynamo process, but what's the geology behind these features? So to know that, it would help to know what, the, what, what is the geometry of the thing that's been magnetized. Is it a bunch of triangles, ellipses? Is it lines? What, what, is the, what does it look like? What is this material that's been magnetized? What does that look like? So I'm going to argue that we may know the geometry now of the Reiner gamma source body. So that will be the conclusion of the talk. So I'll show you that model for what uh, I think the source body looks like, the geometry of that magnetized material. Okay, some background I have to introduce you to to do that, to get to that uh, ar argument. Here's a model that shows you that actually the direction of the magnetic field is uh, important and we, in controlling uh, what's going on at swirls. Okay, uh, so you can see here uh, the, what we think is happening is at swirls, the solar wind is getting in where you have vertical magnetic fields and the solar wind is being deflected away when you see horizontal fields. So horizontal fields are a key part of understanding how swirls form, uh, we think. All right, and so normally the, the bright areas end up uh, showing up where there's the deflection of the protons under the horizontal field. So horizontal fields 
equal bright spots and vertical fields equal dark spots. That's, what we, that's a hypothesis. Uh, so to model Rhino gamma source bodies, uh, previously uh, my student, uh, former student Doug Hemingway, uh, came up with, and I came up with this idea that maybe you can have these arcs of magnetized material inside of Reiner gamma. Okay, you can see those red lines are these, we think maybe there's this, these two lines of magnetic stuff. Um, and that's a nice uh, way to explain a bunch of things. It, it explains the uh, geometry of the field you observe at altitude, uh, but it also uh, it could explain the albedo pattern. So here is that uh, a map of the magnetic field resulting from those arcs of magnetized material. And you can see uh, this horizontal field has these uh, cusp structures in it, where you have dark lanes forming where you have weak horizontal fields, and the plasma can get in. And this is a consequence of that line-shaped uh, uh, structure in the magnetized material. So that was a, a, a nice model to potentially explain what's happening. Uh, but uh, I would, in this talk, I'm going to say, what in the world could possibly produce symmetric elliptical lines of material? That's not really something you see in nature very often, to have these two elliptical kind of symmetric lines of stuff, <laughs> of anything, really. Okay. So uh, to motivate the model a little bit, I came up with this idea that it could be actually a, mo a magnetized disk. And um, maybe I'll just skip this because it's a little bit uh, unnecessary, actually. But this is some theory that went into it. But um, so I'm going to introduce you to what I think may be going on is an elliptical magnetized disk. Uh, and previously, a lot of people have tried to figure out the magnetization direction at Reiner Gamma. because. Uh, you need, that's one of the properties of magnetization as direction. It's not just like gravity, which is um, uh, just magnitude. And all these papers have estimated the magnetization to be along these uh, lines you see, these vectors. Interestingly, I also noticed that these are all perpendicular to the symmetry axis of Reiner gamma. So that was a funny coincidence, and I think that's an important clue on how this thing formed, actually. Uh, so they're magnetized, the disk appears to be magnetized to its symmetry axis, okay? So what does that mean? So to model this, basically, instead of using a, a series of lines, uh, you just take, take a disk and magnetize it the way other people, in the same direction other people have found it to be magnetized. And you can calculate what the field looks like from this thing. And it looks like just a big blob at spacecraft measurement altitudes. You can see that blob there. Um, but the cool thing is, when you look low down by the surface, the horizontal field develops these characteristic uh, cusp structures, just like the simpler uh, line model. And so you get these dark lanes that would presumably be uh, forming at these cusp structures in the horizontal field. Dark lanes form at these zero fields in the horizontal field map. Remember, horizontal fields are important in controlling the plasma flux. And you also get this brighter uh, central area with non-zero uh, fields. So that also matches uh, our predictions from that, that simple model of the plasma interaction with the field. That was kind of neat. Um, so a symmetry of the disk provides uh, these symmetric field structures. And a disk is way more physical than just a, a bunch of lines, lines of stuff. <laughs> Disks of stuff, maybe we can uh, understand. Uh, an interesting kind of consequence of this is that actually at the center of the disk, at the surface, the field is zero. <laughs> so it's kind of a fun uh, application of, this, of magnetic potentials is that uh, for infinitely magnetized sheets, the field goes to zero at the surface. So the most famous magnetic anomaly on the moon, if you're on the surface, you may actually measure zero total field <laughs> because of the perfect symmetry of this feature. So th again, this is just a hypothesis that is consistent with uh, results. So that's just an interesting kind of uh, artifact of that. So okay, what does this mean? How does this thing form? That's what we really want to know. Is it related to craters? Craters are elliptical. That's maybe the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, so we need some elliptical magnetized disk. Um, one idea is that this is a, an elliptical crater that was filled in with some volcanic material that then cooled. Here's a, an example of that on Mars, maybe. Uh, here's an elliptical crater. It's hanging out by a volcano. Could something like that have happened at Reiner Gamma, and then it was eventually buried, and we don't see that crater anymore? But this doesn't explain why it's so magnetic, because actually most volcanic rocks we have from the moon are very weakly magnetic. So it's still a puzzle uh, to, to explain it with this kind of model. Um, here's another elliptical crater, <laughs> also on Mars. 
Uh, this, this one, maybe there was some melt that was mixed with some ex exogenous material from the impactor. Uh, so maybe that is what happened. And also, interestingly, this is so elliptical, this, this crater probably had its top, uh, this impactor probably had its top sheared off and causing this kind of other uh, downstream formation that looks kind of similar, actually, to what you see at Reiner Gamma. So now I'm, I'm speculating, of course. Um, if this is the case, then this wouldn't require a strong dynamo field because you have this exogenous meteoritic material that could be highly magnetic. If this one's true, you may require a strong dynamo field because, like I said, volcanic rocks are not very, they're very weak uh, magnetic remnants carriers. Okay, so those are just my ideas. I don't, we don't know yet, but at least we're making some progress. At least we have an ellipse. Is that 10 minutes? Two minutes. Okay, great. Uh, one other puzzle is why is the magnetization, if you believe this model, why is the magnetization perpendicular to the disk axis? <laughs> Very strange, you know, that's to have such symmetry in, in nature like that, so it's probably a clue to something. So that would work if the ambient field was like this when it was magnetized. Uh, it implies perhaps the impact was oblique, if this was an impactor, uh, impact was oblique in a, and in the spin plane of the moon, and the dynamo field was, had, was essentially a geocentric axial dipole just like the Earth. So if you're at the equator, you come in at this low glancing angle, say, and the fields are up in the page and you magnetize this uh, crater. But uh, it's quite an interesting uh, coincidence. I don't know the origin, but it's a real interesting clue, I think. Um, no one seems to have noticed it before. Uh, ultimately, to test this, here is the line model on the top, the previously published line model I showed you, and the disk model in this talk. And you can see that at very low altitudes, about five kilometers above the source, there's some significant differences in the structure of the field. So we can actually test this hypothesis, these two hypotheses, if we make low altitude measurements. Uh, very low altitudes, it turns out, because actually Reiner Gamma is sitting two kilometers below the mean lunar radius and it may be bur buried beneath another kilometer of basalt. So this five kilometer altitude ends up becoming a two kilometer uh, altitude measurement above the mean lunar radius. So to test what is actually forming Reiner Gamma, I would argue we actually need to get into the two kilometer uh, range. Okay, uh, so conclusions, um, here's another cartoon or uh, illustration of Reiner Gamma compared to the horizontal magnetic fields. Well, uh, Reiner gamma field is explainable by a magnetized disk. It's consistent with the albedo patterns. Um, mysteries remain what caused such a distribution. An elliptical crater is the first thing that maybe comes to everyone's mind when you see an elliptical disk thing. Um, and I would say measurements below two kilometers could help us resolve the origin of this feature. And I will put a uh, advertisement for this mission concept that uh, we are working on known as NanoSwarm which makes measurements at very, very low altitudes at a variety of lunar swirls. So with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, there we go, <laughs> thank you. Um, but um, that, that explains the Reiner Gamma head. What about these tails? Yeah, uh, so uh, if, uh, so my student uh, Megan is gonna give the next talk and there's maybe some insights we can gain from some careful analysis that she's been doing. I will speculate that if this is due to some impact related process, that maybe the tail is also some part of the, related to that impactor that kind of was spewed downrange or came in simultaneously at the same time as that impactor, but I'm totally speculating. I, I, I don't, I don't know, it's a, it's a great question. Megan does have some interesting new observations that could maybe give us some insight. Is there, is there time? Yeah, yeah, we can be up there. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, the only thing is about, you know, getting an elliptical crater like that, if, if, let's assume it's an elliptical crater, you know, those are really exceptional. You don't see many of them anywhere. And it's, it's so puzzling. So it makes me wonder, I mean, could, uh, I mean, imagine you had a projectile that was a different composition than your standard ordinary chondrite. Let's say it's very iron rich. 
would that give you a preference for getting an elliptical crater? Maybe you could hit it at a higher angle and then that would give you something. And then that would also help explain what you're looking at. I'm just, mm, yeah. I, I'm just speculating. But I'm just right, speculating. no, I, I think what you're saying, yeah, there's two interesting coincidences. There's a magnetic anomaly, which is yeah. very unusual, and there's an elliptical crater, which is unusual. So it's this confluence of factors. And yeah, maybe it's something like you suggest could, could help explain it. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. It, it, do we have any idea of the age of when that crater would have formed? Is it? Uh, because it, it has to be buried, right? Meg, yeah, it has to be buried, but it could be. Megan has some results that maybe constrain when it formed, actually. So I'll, okay. I'll leave that to, to her. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because Ian's timing is perfect, I think we have time for one last question. Just uh, are you in the swirls formed? Well, there's a general hypothesis that you, you, you have, uh -huh. which is very interesting, but there are also a whole bunch of other areas and, and geometries of swirls. Yes, and uh, our, we have tried to focus on Reiner Gamma uh, first, <laughs> and and at least at least figure out well, that how that one formed. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. But the the the, uh, the extrapolation of the general hypothesis, not the cratering hypothesis so much, but your general hypothesis will be very interesting. You've got lots of areas to test it. Yes, <laughs> we do. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for your comment. <laughs>